Welcome, everybody. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, this is the third and uh, maybe not the last installment, but at least it is for a while, of uh, the active threat for this central office. And I want to tell you, the reason we call it active threat is because it's not just about shooting. Um, in the last several years, we've seen attacks by hatchets, by knives, by long broadswords, and unfortunately by vans and trucks and other such devices. So it's sort of just a general response. But we are going to specifically focus on someone entering this building or a building with either a pistol or a rifle and how we might deal with that. So before I do that, I want to wish you all happy Star Wars Day. Uh, it is May the 4th, so May the 4th be with you all. So um, this presentation is based on a sound presentation developed by a group of people that sort of evaluated these active threats and active shooter situations and created this program called ALICE. When I went to university many years ago at University of Missouri, which is where um, I evolved from before I came to you all last year, um, I went to work at the University Police Department and we started talking about this, especially after there were several shootings like at the community college at UMCO in Oregon and things like that. And I was sitting there with the chief of police and he goes, we need to revive this. Uh, the chancellor's really interested in reviving this. And I said, okay, I understand you use the ALICE program. And he goes, yes. And I said, do you know what ALICE means? And he said, no. I said, okay. And then he said, we use tigers. You know, we have to be cute. If you're a MU person, you have to use tigers. I said, do you know what tigers means as far as what it means? And he goes, no. I said, do you know what run, hide, fight means? He goes, that I know. I said, why don't we just use that? Because the whole world's using that now, and we don't need to be cute about something that's serious. So that's what we went with. And pretty much the whole world's going with run, hide, fight. So Alice is basically run, hide, fight. So it's tigers. So, but we're just going to stick with that. So an active threat is a deliberate attempt on the part of someone to deliberately harm a lot of people. So it's the danger to the workplace, whether they're bringing a knife or a sword or something. The subject is armed, typically with a gun, but not always, and they're coming after either an individual or a group of individuals, and they're going after as many people to harm as they possibly can. And typically, they want to die in the process. Most of us have known since we were children uh, what to do in case there's a tornado. And hopefully you've seen the weather video that we've put online. Uh, if you haven't, you probably should. It's now May. Um, but there is a weather video that we made a couple weeks ago and we put online for how to understand weather. But we know what to do in case there's a tornado, right? We know what to do in this building. And we know what to do if there's a fire alarm. Gosh knows we know what to do in this building in case there's a fire alarm. We practice on a regular basis. We see Jill running around with a radio. Jill knows what to do. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not really sure about what to do in an active threat, at least as adults. Now, as children, we do. They practice lockdown all the time. There's been a lot of children on the news lately saying how actually depressing it is that they have to actually practice that. But they have to because they're not emancipated yet. They're not 18 years old. But after 18 years old, they have decisions. They have the right to make their own decision, which is why we have the options of run, hide, fight. So let's talk a little bit about how they differ from other things. If there's a robbery or a hostage situation, um, they typically aren't out to just kill a bunch of people. But in an active threat situation, they want notoriety or they want revenge. Like in the Google situation that happened a couple weeks ago, she wanted revenge. Uh, she was mad. Um, they want either against an individual or an organization. Um, and they want a high number of injuries or deaths. In the case of a robbery that most attackers don't plan on dying, but in a shooting situation, they absolutely plan on dying, either by themselves, by shooting themselves, or they want the police officer to shoot them. Okay? So negotiations with these people usually are absolutely futile. So if you remember what happened with the car attack that happened two weeks ago with the van, you remember what the guy was doing? He was pulling out a cell phone and going like this. And he was yelling at the cop. Do you all remember what he's yelling at the cop? Do you want to remember? Please shoot me in the head. Yelling it over and over again. Shoot me in the head. Shoot me in the head. And the police officer just stood there, backing up and backing up and backing up. Never shot him at all. But that's what he wanted. He wanted to die. He wanted that police officer to shoot him and kill him. So 
The suspect usually achieves these goals by choosing a high profile location and it's full of people, it's easy to get into, there's a mass casualty environment there and there's usually a little resistance by the occupants but, and they usually know the situation and the environment very well. They're former employees or they've cased the building multiple times. Um, so they're very familiar with the environment. So let's just look a little bit about where these things take place. So I want you to point out that actually uh, schools are actually one of the most safe places that children can be. Um, government, uh, government buildings are also very, very safe. But still 10% doesn't make me feel very good. I mean 9% of the time we may be safe. But uh, commerce, in other words businesses, are where most of these events take place. Um, healthcare, residences, these are uh, killings, uh, family killings and f uh, family suicides, those types of things. But government is about 10, 10 and a half percent. So they really don't happen that often. Now these only, these uh, statistics only go through 16, so we haven't seen the impacts of last year's events on this data. So obviously outdoor is going to change from Las Vegas um, and some of these others. But these numbers have stayed steady, relatively steady, over the last several years. But um, these are generally have stayed the same over the last decade or so. So let's talk a bit about what people believe about active threats that really aren't true. Myth number one, assailants always display tendency towards violent acts. This is not true. Okay? In, the, in retrospect, when we start investigating, we find out some things about these people but while many do show signs, in most cases those behaviors do not manifest themselves until the incident or after the incident. So prevention may not be an option. They find them on their Facebook pages or some manifesto that they discover. Um, I was just watching the news last night and they were talking about the Vegas incident. They still don't know why that guy did it. No, they can't find anything about why he may have done it. So I do want to point this out, and we see this a lot, especially after a shooting. But only 4% of all violence of any kind, whether it's just someone attacking another person physically or all the way up to someone using a rifle and shooting a lot of people, can be attributed to someone with a diagnosed mental illness. 4%. So when you see one of these incidents and you see a spokesman for a department get up there and say, well, this person must be a mentally ill, that is not accurate. And the reason, what do you think the reason is they're doing that? Anyone want to take a stab at it? Because it's not normal. So if it's not normal, they must be mentally ill, right? So they're just blowing that over into our world, which is really hard for us to deal with. And I'm in a lot of meetings with people, and I say I'm from the Department of Mental Health, and they just look at me like, wow, your life must be horrible dealing with all these people that are shooting people. <laughs> yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> but, so we really have to push back hard on that. So I encourage any of you, if you're in meetings like that, remember that statistic. 4% of all violence, not just gun violence, all violence, diagnosed mental illness. All right. So it will never happen here. Obviously, it can happen anywhere. The big ones that come out are the big Vegas incidents. There's the ones like the Columbine High School, the Virginia Tech. We just met a professor this early this week that was at Virginia Tech. He's still working on that. Sandy Hook. Umqua, which I just uh, mentioned, that wasn't two years ago. But unfortunately, if I put up all the incidents up here, just this year alone, it would fill up this entire thing. So there are lots and lots of things. It can literally happen anywhere at any time. And just this year alone, we've seen schools, we've seen malls, we've seen people mowed down on, in streets. It just happens all the time. So pre-planned security measures and infrastructure, they can help but they will not deter most because if they're determined, they will do it. So myth number three, police will always respond in time. Sure, and I've got some land to sell you, okay? So Columbine Library, 7.5 minutes, the school recess officer was there. 
Norris Hall, Virginia Tech, eight minutes, and they were already on scene 800, 800 yards away because he'd already killed people and left the campus and came back. So there were cops already there. Success, Tech High School, two minutes, and they were across the street from the FBI. Now, we have evacuated this building, in my count, in the last six months, three, three times, Jill? I think, so. I think I showed up late once, and I caught you guys evacuating. I sat in my car and go, man, I'm glad I'm not out there in the cold this time. <laughs> so, Jill, I'm just going to ask you to guess. How long does it take for them to get here? And that's with an automatic alarm. I'd say four to five minutes. Yeah, I, I looked at my watch and once and it was like seven. Sooner, yeah, it, so four to five minutes. How long does it take these things to resolve themselves? Do you guys know? Have any idea? The average is less than five minutes. Okay, the one that happened most recently uh, in Tennessee, 90 seconds, which felt like 10 minutes or two hours, but 90 seconds. So employees can do nothing against an armed intruder. Absolutely not true. A large number of people will get up and run, which is exactly what we want them to do if they know what they're doing. Further numbers will escape if you encourage them. Come on, come with me, let's get out of here. Shooting, though, is a physical skill. The degree of accuracy and the level is directly dependent on the actions of the target. So how many of you have ever shot a rifle? Pretty easy, right? If the target is dead still and right in front of you. How about a pistol? Still pretty easy if the target is close. Now we start backing away. How easy is it to hit that target? If you've got a rifle, it's still pretty easy. Now I'm going to stand up and start waving that target around. Now try to hit it. So if someone walked through this door right now, even with a rifle, and we all got up and started running around and yelling, how easy do you think it would be for that person to actually shoot and kill somebody? Dang near impossible. So I was at a meeting last week with a guy that's retired from the patrol, and his brother was bragging about how good of a shot he was. So he challenged his brother. He said, you pick out any target you want, at any distance you want, and I challenge you to hit it. Now, here's what, here's what the statistics are for law enforcement. At close range, with their weapon that they train on three times a year with hundreds of rounds, okay? They train three times a year with hundreds of rounds. Their accuracy rate is 22%, 22%. So his brother said, I'm a really good shot. So he says, go ahead, I'm not gonna touch you. So his <laughs> brother brings his pistol up, gets ready to shoot, and he starts yelling in his ear, and he's got earmuffs on. Starts yelling in his ear. Guess how many rounds he put in the target? So if we get up and we create a distraction, start running around, even though one of us may get tagged with a bullet, what do you think the odds of us, one of us getting killed are? They're pretty much zero. Okay? So we could do something about this, and that's what we're here to tell you about. So here's some truths. So here's some timelines. Killed is red, wounded, uh, I'm sorry, killed is blue, wounded red, duration of impact. So I don't know, many of you probably aren't old enough to remember the Austin, Texas Tower shooting. Oh, do not even act like you remember that. Okay, so, <laughs> Deb's back going, yeah, I remember that. Sure you do, Deb. So, 90, there was 90 minutes, and there's a reason for that. If anyone knows about the University of Texas, there's this big tower in this big open field, basically, and he went to the middle of the tower and kept everyone at bay, and they waited for SWAT, and they were taking pot shots at him and all that other stuff. He finally ran out of ammunition, and they stormed the tower and all that other jazz. So, but then, Salt Lake City Square, and then we get into Littleton, Colorado, Fort AMS. Basically, they surrounded the school on four different sides and waited for SWAT to arrive three or four different SWAT teams, and then they charge a the school. So basically, this changed everything. So what did it change? We realized that surrounding a school and waiting for SWAT to arrive was the wrong way to do it. So what do we do now? The first cop arrives on the scene, he pulls out his weapon, and he enters that school, he steps over <coughs> anyone that's wounded, and he heads towards the sound of gunshots. 
And the first person he sees with a weapon, he takes aim and he starts shooting at it until the shooting stops. Okay? That's what we do now. And we go until we don't have any more bullets left. And the next guy comes in the exact same way. And the next guy comes in the exact same way. And the SWAT shows up at some point, that's all good. Okay? So we have totally changed the way that we do business in the law enforcement world. So these are just some of the top 10 mass shootings. We do have Las Vegas on there. But these are just some of the outstanding ones. There. I mean, not outstanding, some of the worst ones. Um, and you can see that there's some trends here, which are really kind of sad in a way. But the numbers are going up. The incidents per year are going up. And the number of people being shot and killed are going up. The number of casualties are going up. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. One is they're choosing the targets more carefully. They're, the lethality of the weapons that they're choosing are going up. They're planning it better. In other words, you saw what the guy did in Vegas. He, he made about <coughs> 10 trips into the, his hotel room with different weapon systems. He was armed to the teeth. Okay? He planned it and planned it and planned it. So just since 200, between 2000 and 2016, there's been 220 incidents of shootings. There's been 1486 casualties with 661 killed and 825 wounded. And so those that, are just mass shootings. Yeah, that's just mass shootings. That's not the casual, I mean casual, but that's not the boom, you're dead shooting. That happens in Chicago like 40 times a day. So let's talk a little about truths. If the suspect's coming, after you, they're going to get in. So I don't know if you remember about Sandy Hook, but in Sandy Hook, the shooter, the door was locked. The front door was locked. So what he did is he tried the front door, he stepped to the side, shot the glass out, and walked through the glass. Okay? So if they want in, they're coming. And I'm going to pick on Diane. So Diane's a lovely person, always got along with you, but you ticked me off last week. So I'm going towards HR, and I'm coming in. That door's locked. I'm going to shoot that door. I'm coming towards Diane, but I'm going to take out everyone between here and there, but I'm leaving one bullet for you, baby. Okay? So if I'm coming, I'm coming, and nothing's going to stop me. Okay? So I will find you. And there's not a darn thing anyone can do to stop me unless someone intervenes in the meantime between the time I get there. If able, the attacker will hurt you. They are committed 100%. And what you do, though, can radically change that outcome. So what are you willing to do? We'll show you. So deaths are often exceed the injured, which is really, really strange. That is not a normal thing. And why the number skewed? Because is it the skill of the shooter or is it the easy target? It's both in most cases. In the, in the sense, well, going back to Virginia Tech, the dude actually practiced killing people. Not only did he practice hitting targets that were standing up, he practiced walking along like this and shooting things on the ground. And that's exactly what he did. Passive static targets become easy victims. Do you believe it? I hope you do, because that's exactly what happens. It's what happened at Sandy Hook. It's what happened in Parkland. Okay? If people freak out and hide, and they don't hide the right way, and get prepared to do other things, they become basically just a sitting target. Okay? So if we start moving away from it, if we start just moving, and we create a distraction, we're going to make it very, very difficult for them to accomplish what they're there to accomplish. So what's happening in this picture? Can you all see that picture very well? The bunch of people hiding, looking at their phone, tweeting, texting, calling. So here's what, this is actually at Virginia Tech, okay? 
This is in a building that's adjacent to the classroom building where the mass shooting took place. It is connected to that building. Don't know if they know that. They probably know that. But they have locked down inside of a classroom. They did not barricade. They have a TV on with the volume on and are watching it take place and are basically just lined up, sitting ducks, because that's what they were taught to do in grade school. They were not taught to get up and run. And that's exactly what they should all be doing. Run, run, run until you've run out of breath. So disadvantage of hiding in place, people are in the shooting zone way too long. Even if they're aiming at you while you're running, your chances of survival are above 95%. The shooter likely knows the employee routes and routines and will target that area. Medical attention will be delayed until security is established, but new tactics in law enforcement are changing that, and here's what I mean by that. Right now, the first arriving officer will pull his weapon and enter, and the next one will too, but as soon as EMTs come, we will establish a security team with those EMTs, and as soon as that one area is cleared, the EMTs will go to work, and they will have security with them, and they will keep moving and moving with this as long as those areas are secured. That's a new technique that we're practicing now, and hopefully will become the norm. And, sur and survivors will suffer some kind of psychological impact if they do nothing at all. So here, here's a historical police response to active threats. Columbine, like I said, changed everything. We used to secure, and that's all we did. Parkland showed us that that tactic, again, does not work. And that was simply because the guy freaked out or something happened. We're really not sure why he didn't do what he was trained to do, but he didn't. And a lot of people died because of that. They just stood by. So. The current active threat response differs from that of a hostage barricade, you know that, and it is pull the weapon and go after the bad guy. I keep saying guy because 95% or better of the time, it's a white male. So today's police response to active threat. The goal of the police is to stop the threat, responding officers draw their weapon and immediately head towards gunfire, and their search officers will step over uh, and not assist wounded and injured victims are assisted by EMTs when it is secure. All right, there are better options. Run, hide, fight. So pay attention to all the options here. We have a new hero. His name is James Shaw. Does anyone know who James Shaw is? Yeah, he's a hero, man. You know what he did? He ran. When he heard the gunfire, he ran to the bathroom, he hid and locked down. As soon as he heard a break in the, sh in the shooting, he came out and whooped that dude's butt. He took the gun away from him, threw it over the counter, and the guy freaked out and ran. You know what they found in that guy's pocket? Three full magazines. Three full magazines. Man, he's, he's a stud. <laughs>
Do not call anyone unless you absolutely have valuable information. Okay? So you need to remember, these really don't happen in government buildings that often, but if you do see something that's valuable, say something. So um, if you do not have an office that locks, and I'm looking at Diane again because they have a lot of, they have two offices that lock. The others don't. But you need to know that. So in your area, you need to know where the offices of lock are. So if you are trapped there, you can go to those very quickly. So go orient yourself to all those areas in your, your area where you're working. Figure out where those offices are that lock. Pam, you need to go in one of those locked offices if that's where you're going to go. You guys are trapped. Yeah. So everyone needs to kind of just figure that out. And that's just a very simple thing. I'm not trying to freak you out. Just figure out. Situation awareness is all it. Okay? So that's all. Hide. Obviously, lock the door, barricade. We're going to show you some more about that here in a little bit. But turn off the lights, silence that phone, get it on vibrate, and then start barricading. And then with hide comes, start making that plan. Because if they're coming after you, you need to be ready. Okay? Now, I want to talk a little bit about that coming after you. If there is something that's happened in your personal life, whether it's a significant other or some other thing that's happened that's caused you to be afraid for your own safety, even in this environment or somewhere else, you need to let someone know. And what I mean by someone, you need to let your supervisor know, you need to let HR know, so that the office is aware of that, so that we're all safe. This has happened before here. And so it's incumbent upon you, not only for your own safety, but for my safety, for everyone else's safety, to let someone know if something's happened that might jeopardize that, okay? We would appreciate it. And we will make sure that the front desk knows and the right people know so that we're all safe. So hide, lock the doors, provide a barrier by barricading, and then do everything you can to hide from that shooter's view. Now that, that gal with the copier, I thought that was kind of cute, um, but she had those big piles of boxes of paper. Why not use the copier to barricade the door and then hide behind the paper, which would stop a bullet pretty effectively. So, you know, and, and no one turned out the lights because they were filming, um, but they would have naturally have turned off the lights, but, you know, move that copier in front of the door. Now maybe throw a box of paper, push a box of paper off that pile behind the copier so the copier doesn't move, okay? But all those would have been, have been great things for her to do. So if secondary inter exits are around, remember where they are. Does anyone, has anyone looked in their desk and found a hammer? I found one in my desk, yeah. That, I think someone bought hammers years ago um, for people who had windows or people who wanted to bludgeon someone to death. Um, <laughs> But it was, from a, it was from years ago when we did this type of thing. Um, but there are also buddy rooms, which we talked about, those rooms that have locks. Or that's a buddy room right next door. Okay? But if you, uh, you actually you have a buddy room, there's a doorway that you've got two doorways in and out of your office. So we need to understand where those places are. But we need to look at our offices and our areas to figure out what we can use to barricade. And can we lock, can we secure? Uh, in this environment, we can look up there, we can secure this door. They don't lock, but we can secure them. We've got plenty of wires in this room if we have time to wire those doors shut. But if we have that kind of time, why aren't we running? So those are all decisions at the OODA loop. We need to concentrate on really what is it we're trying to accomplish here. <clears throat> Once we're secure, we need to have a personal plan. Uh, and remember, if someone starts knocking on that door and says, let me in, let me in, they may be under duress. They may have a gun to their head. So this is a really tough personal decision, especially if it's your best friend or your colleague. Well, it depends on the day you're having, I guess. <laughs> she said, or your husband. Uh, I guess if you're having a good day with them, you let them in. Or not. Good luck. See you at home. Maybe. And then, of course, fight is the final one. Um, throw objects at the attacker's face and attack with absolute maximum violence. We're going to demonstrate that here in a minute. But what we want you to do 
is if you can't get out, as soon as you hide, you need to start talking to each other and come up with a plan. And hiding alone is not really what you want to do. You want to start planning that process as soon as you're hiding, very quietly. If there's two or three of you hiding, you need to start planning that. So what you want to do is you want to be, start to plan. You're gonna, we're going to throw things. We're going to scream. And we're going to attack that person. We're going to go right after him. And we're going to throw anything we can find. And we want to swarm. Swarm is if there's more than two of us, we're going after. And we're gonna, our intent is to try to kill that person, frankly. Okay? Whether it's with that hammer you have in your desk, or a pair of scissors, or whatever it is, we're going to go. So someone needs to control the weapon because they're still going to remain, that's still going to remain in their hands. So someone needs to grab their arms with the weapon, and then someone needs to go for the head because wherever the head goes, the body's going to go. And if there's more people, then someone needs to go for the torso or the legs. So if someone grabs the head, their head accidentally comes off, you win. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay. So I've, I've got some volunteers here. So um, here's what we're going to do. These are, these are heavy objects, but not for Eric. Okay. So Eric's going to be the attacker coming in. You, you ready? You want, you want to attack me? Yeah, you do. You know you do. Yeah. Becky always wants to throw something at me. Yep. Jill's got some pent-up frustration with me. I know that. And Pam does, too. Pam, I'm going to give you a football. All right, Layman, I'm going to give you one, too, because Gloria said you wanted a Death Star. You got a Death Star? There you go. There, this is the attacker's head came off. So you get to throw that. Here you go. Anybody else want to try it? Oh, you're going to throw from way back there? All right. So here, Becky, you want to set the plan? You want to set the plan? No, go for it. You have the mic. Okay, so the plan is going to be when I say, and some, I'm not me now, I'm, I'm Eric and I'm in the room. When I say go, everyone's going to throw and scream, okay? And then at the same time, what's going to actually happen is we're going to throw, we're going to scream, and then a team is going to attack, but we're going to save the attack for next step so you can see it, okay? So when I say go, which is Eric not being the attacker, you're going to throw that stuff at me and scream, ready? So I'm coming through the door. It's all right. Stand up if you have to. Go. All right. So actually, someone did hit me. <laughs> Pretty good. All right. So you saw what I did. I went like this to protect myself. The gun immediately went up in the air. I may be actually be shooting up in the air. Who knows? So I'm like this. I am now in a defensive posture, and all of you are still safe. So immediately upon doing that, what's going to happen next? We're going to attack that dude. So I'm going to be replaced by my good friend Jill, and we're going to kill Jill. Or attack Jill. Well, we're going to kill her. With minimal force. Yeah. So I need, I need some volunteers that wants to help us. Anyone want to help us take down Jill? I just need one more person. Just need one more. Just me. Come on. Anyone. Yeah, Jill. Jill, Jill's already been attacked twice, so yeah. she knows what she's doing. So, do you, do you remember the last where where I was? I was like this. Okay. So, what I'm going to do? Is, here's the plan. I'm going for the gun. Um, what do you want? You're going to go for the head. Mm -hmm. Okay. So go you go for legs. Okay. So the balls have just been thrown. So on the count of go. Ready? With I'm gonna minimal go, force. I'm going to go like this. And I'm going to take you like this. We're going to take. Gonna go back. I'm going to take her down all the way to the <laughs> and I'm literally going to lay on top of her, and Becky's going to stay away from that gun. That's for dang sure. Yeah. But, okay, thanks, Jill. Minimal. This, and this Jill, in real life would be maximum force. Yeah, and I literally would but just fall, we'd Jill, literally fall right on so top of her. On her neck. And then if anyone else is in the room, they're coming in and just beating her to death. <laughs> if they got the hammer, they're hammering on her face. Okay? And guess what? If, it, if she survives it, which hopefully she won't, court of law, you're defending yourself. I see, I see a whole lot of, are we terrified? <laughs> I know this is not really a good thing, but it will save your life, literally save your life. It's between you and them. 
<laughs> yeah, they're, they're there to kill you. Yeah. So. so we're going to swarm. We're going to rush together. First thing we're going to do is attack. And then we've got to control that weapon, though. So here's a really important thing. If the weapon comes loose or someone gets it away from them, that has to be disposed of very, very quickly. Kick it away. If you pick it up, do not pick it up like you're going to use it. Because if you accidentally pick it up and all of a sudden a law enforcement guy shows up and you're standing over and everyone's screaming, running around on the ground, and you're standing over somebody with it like that, who's going to get shot? Yeah. So it gets up, picked up, dumped in the trash can or put over to the side. No one touches that thing. Okay? Plus it's evidence and you don't want your fingerprints all over. So we demonstrated that. So do everything the police tell you to do. Do keep your hands. If you're told to evacuate and you're done, you walk or run like this. Hands out, palms out. Okay? Do not ever brandish a weapon. That includes, if once you're done with this person, drop them all, push them away from you, and do whatever the police tell you to do. And that includes if they tell you to get down on the ground and they start zip tying you or handcuffing you. Just do it. You'll be fine. Okay? Whatever you do, do not re-enter the building unless told to do so, and do not get up in a policeman's face. Okay? Just do whatever they tell you and get away from it. Remember, while you're running or hiding, call 911, but only call 911 if you have valuable information. Okay? I saw this dude with a gun. That is not valuable information. Okay? Valuable information would be a gunman at DMH central office came through this front door and headed towards Diane's office. That would be valuable information. But just calling 911 to verify there's a gunman is not helpful. Calling mom to say that there's a gunman in our office is not helpful. Okay? So restraint is very, very important here. So I'm going to hand this over to Becky. So we're going to talk about central office here. Um, and we're going to start at the very beginning of our building. And I want you to think about if you're entering this building as an employee, what you think about, but if you're also if you're trying to escape this building as an employee, what do you see? So as you look at this, I'm standing right outside here at Central Office. What do you what comes to mind here? What do you see? Glass. Glass. Yeah. Do, do these doors lock? They do lock. They do lock. Um, if the receptionist sees somebody suspicious um, walking up, they have a button at their desk that they can hit to lock it. Um, and it locks it immediately. It's very quick. Like even if they had their hand on this handle here um, and they hit that button, it locks it. Now, will that keep somebody out if they really want to get in? No. But it gives them a matter of time, right? They could immediately leave and run and start yelling things. Um, chances are somebody's not going to come up brandishing a weapon, so they're not going to see that um, and know that immediately. But say that you have put them on alert already. You have, as Eric talked about earlier, let them know that there's a threat maybe to yourself, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it is a consumer, maybe it's an angry constituent. Um, so that you've put them on alert, maybe they have a picture at the front desk, so they have an idea that some, there's some sort of threat and so they can be paying extra close attention. So that can be very beneficial. Um, so what are they going to do to get in if that door is locked? Somehow break that glass out, right? Like, like they did at uh, Sandy Hook and walk right in. Do those second set of doors lock? Anybody know? They don't. So you literally have a matter of seconds if you're sitting at that front desk to run. And as you run, if you hear somebody screaming, what are you going to yell, Jill? Shooter. Shooter. Shooter, 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 shooter. Run, run, run. Run. Just get up and go. Okay. So we come in the building. First thing they see there is the receptionist. And then the next thing they see are these right here. Let's see if this is the laser. Okay. Right here is the conference room next to us. And right standing at the edge of the picture is the doors to this conference room. And right here is the director's office. So they walk in. Where do you think they're going? 
they're coming in here if they see us, right? Or the next conference room here, or they're going right here to the director's office. So what do we see in these uh, pictures here that can be useful, whether you're running or you're trying to hide or you're fighting? What do we see? Say that again. Doors. 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 Yeah. Closing doors. Obvi yeah. We want to close doors. What else? That little reflector. Yes. That you can see who's coming. Yes. Right here. Right here there's one and there's one right here. Um, they're all over the hallways and outside of doors and we use them all the time um, or at least I do so that I don't spill my coffee on somebody or my tea as I'm coming out of the break room or running around in a corner so I don't run into people um, but if you're trying to hide or run to a place where you can hide or run out of the building these are great because you can look in these and try to see if somebody's coming or see if it's clear and now I mean you're gonna have to probably look around and and still use your eyes to scope the areas out but these will give you that idea of if anyone is in that immediate area what about this hallway anybody know anything about this hallway so this entrance right here is this door right here what do you think you could use this for this area for and there's an exit on the right yes yeah there's an exit so you may be running through to get out this way and come right out here. Or you may be coming, if we're in this conference room and say we hear a gunshot somewhere else, we may be, have to run that way, depending on where the shooter is or if we see somebody entering the building. I mean, you never know. You can run. There's two exits here. It's actually a buddy room like Eric was talking about here, too. Anybody know where that is? That buddy room? Whose office is it? Deborah has a buddy room, yeah. Deborah has two exits in her office. Who else? One is always barricaded though. Yeah, Deborah's is one is always barricaded, so you're you're not gonna be able to get in that way. You might be able to get out, yeah. but you're not gonna be able to get in that way. There's another office in this area, back in this corner that is a buddy room. The deputy director's office has another door. So there's two doors for the deputy director's office. So that's another buddy room that you can use. Um, anything else stand out about these that you might have to, uh, or that you could use if you were fighting? What a, yes, Jill. Fire extinguisher. Yeah, the fire extinguisher. These are, there's 23 of them, 24 of them in our building. Use a fire extinguisher to fight. You don't even have to set it off. You can hit somebody with it. That'll hurt. What else could you fight with in this, this hall? Pictures. Pictures. Pull a picture off and use a picture. Yeah, if you're fighting for your life, you're not gonna get in trouble for taking something and using it as a weapon. Okay. I can also add that the studio door at yes. the very end, that right. has a lock on it. Ah, okay. Good, good to know. I did not know that myself. And I should, it's right across from my <laughs> office. Uh, yeah, my office doesn't have a lock on it, but so this one right here does. Mm -hmm. So Some if you could get in there. This also have the windows that you might be able to get in, lock them in and as you're thinking about it, kick the window out and go. Yes. Kind of like the side window yes, right a lot of the offices have <laughs> windows that you could kick out. Absolutely. So then I walk in and I stand right out here in the middle and I look down both hallways. What do you see in these hallways? What stands out to you or uh, as that you can use? that you can use these hallways for. Say it again. Exit. exit, absolutely. There's exit at both ends of these hallways at the very end. What else? Don't run straight. Ah, yes. Don't run straight. You don't want to run straight. You want to zigzag. We have these great entrances all the way down the hall for all these different areas. Run in, go down that way, run back out, and then go and get yourself zigzagged through. Better way to be safe. Um, who was here for the active shooter drill we did? I think it was 10, 12 years ago. Anybody? What do you remember about these hallways? Do you remember the problem with it? I don't remember. Okay. Bottleneck. Bottleneck. We had a huge bottleneck. Everyone tried to get out of the exact same door. 
And so we had this bottleneck at the end of the hall, which makes what? A great target. A great target. So thinking through, how are you going to get out of this building? Do you want to go out where everybody else is? Do you know a different way out? Have you practiced those way, ways out? So thinking through that. Again, you have the mirrors. You have, um, oh, somewhere down here, you have fire extinguishers as well. Um, actually, several places along there. And you have pictures, again, that you can use. So things you can use in the hallway. So we're going to talk about securing and barricading. We're going to watch an inside edition clip that we found. Um, so this right here, these hinges on the doors, and we have them on the conference room doors. You know, you can use an item like a belt. You can use an item like a cord. These cords here, I would rip them out of the wall and wrap them around. Um, now, in the video, you'll see a belt. He takes a belt and he wraps it up and he puts it and like secures it. You have to wrap it multiple times. Know that. You don't just stop once. You would wrap it multiple times and pull it through to tighten it to barricade that door. But there's some good things in this video. This guy's very gung-ho. I'm just going to tell you. Um, and he does one thing that he advises one thing in here that we don't want you to do, and that is to set off the sprinklers. He says, take a lighter and set off the sprinklers. Anybody know why we wouldn't want you to do that? Yeah, it gets everything wet, but does it go in the entire building if you set it off in one area? Mm -mm. No, it doesn't. So you, you're just doing nothing but making yourself wet <laughs> if you set the sprinklers off. Um, now, the alarm will go off, so that's a good thing. But we have fire alarms you can pull as you're running all over this building. So I would highly encourage you to pull a fire alarm rather than setting off a sprinkler. So you saw the belt, and that's where I said, you know, continue. Don't just stop at one. If it's a cord, do the same thing. But we have doors like this all around here, so you can know that you can barricade yourself using these. So knowing where you can exit. Um, how many of you know where every exit is, or you think you know where every exit is in this building? And you've walked it. Have you walked through the building and looked? I know, I know Eric has. He did it on his first day, I think, uh, in the office. <laughs> walked to make sure. So there's lots of these areas that you can run to that I, I didn't know for years were around the building. Um, for example, if you walk back through admin, which you admin folks know, you can go back behind where disaster services sits. And it comes out right by this garage door. Um, there's an area there. All you would have to do is hit that garage door button and run, and you go down this this alleyway here. It comes out right looking at these and you run out. You can also go out that alleyway through, this is the break room right here, you can go through um, and run out that door there. There's also, by the break room here, another one of those buddy classrooms you can run through, or buddy rooms where you can run right out the break room, right into this, um, I guess it's an IT area, and then right into towards DBH and run that way. Um, you could hide and lock. This door locks here. This is where the supplies are. Granted, it's got a window, but you could still lock it. There's lots of heavy objects in there that you could barricade um, yourself in there with. So knowing where these places are, walking around the office and just looking is good. The other thing I want to talk to you about is how do we inform each other to stay away from the building or that something's happening in the building. We have lots of things that we can do. Um, Eric talked about when you run out of the building, if you see somebody trying to come in, you obviously want to stop them and tell them, don't go in the building. But we also have a lot of staff that travel. Or maybe something happens at the beginning of the day, like the fire alarm has done to us. Or maybe it's at the end of the day. Or maybe it's at lunchtime. People are coming and going all the time. So how do we let people know, stay away? So we are currently working on, um, and hopefully by June this will be set up, a mass notification system that will be sent out for the entire department. It's going to be DMH wide. It's in the state. All of our facilities, um, with exception of a couple, and then all of our regional offices are using it, and all of our DD HAB centers are going to use it. Um, central offices is, is going to use it as well and what it is is you as employees will sign up for a mass notification um, so you can get text messages, you can get phone calls, you can get a voicemail. Think about when you have kids in school and they close school or there's ice, they send you a text message. 
that's what this is. And so should something happen, we can send out an alert to let you know, stay away. It can be used in this type of situation. It can be used in fire drills. It can be used um, severe weather, but it's only gonna be used for emergency purposes for DMH employees. Um, email messages, the system will send email messages to your desktop if you're logged on, but you can also, if you're trapped in your room and you, for whatever reason, wanted to, you could send an email message to each other. Um, social media is something we would utilize in the event to keep people away from the building as well. Um, once we had somebody out of the building that was secure and okay to use that. The other thing to let you know is that at this building where we're located there will be lots of people responding. Eric talked to you about what police will do but they will be Capitol Police is who responds here but Capitol Police has told me Jeff City Police Department will get here before Capitol Police. Um, and on top of that, we're right next to the Highway Patrol. Highway Patrol will be responding. We also have FBI in, the, in this. Uh, they have a building in, not too far from um, the police department, so I imagine FBI will show up on scene as well. We have resources out there for employees, for you to share with each other, for you to view. Um, on Office of Disaster Services, DMH Online, the, these uh, videos are out there of the productions we're doing or disaster track that we're doing, but you can also find resources for schools and each other on planning for these types of events. And then of course the employee assistance program, we always highlight the EAP because that's something that we know after an event would be critically important is to utilize the EAP for services. The other thing I want to tell you is, and if you saw the latest Coop Scoop newsletter, you saw this in there. Um, this is the message from DMH, is that we want to make sure people understand if you see something, say something. Um, don't pick up the phone and, and call somebody. We, or what we don't want people to do is call somebody here at DMH and say, you know, I'm concerned about somebody's mental health because they've made threats. We want them to actually call the police if that's the case. So if, if somebody sees something, they should say something, even if they're not sure, even if they think they might be wrong, which recently happened to me. Um, but I called, the, I called the police recently when I saw something and we laughed about it, but you just never know. I, there was a gentleman with a rifle in the middle of the road, or standing on the side of the road, and I thought that was odd. Okay, well thank you guys. If you think of questions, feel free to let Eric and I know.